How are you doing, ER students? It's been a minute since I've seen you. I've had to step away for the past week or two due to a family death, but I'm happy to be back here with you. I truly am. It is what gives me inspiration and joy. And you know what? I think the guest that we have here today is also going to give us some inspiration and joy about a better world that he is helping create ahead. So true to the nature of what we've always told you, we will not waste your time. Let's jump right into it and go through some housekeeping. Nick Gallo, can you confirm my screen, please? Nothing yet, just your smiling face. Oh, okay. How about now, any luck? Nothing yet. Okay, one sec. How's it's that? It's thinking, it's showing now. Woohoo! Okay, students, so a couple quick notes uh, for housekeeping. One, I've heard that some of you are having some trouble logging in, and I want to reinforce how critical it is that you use the UMish uh, emails and accounts you have to log in via Zoom. There's a couple of you who are on uh, via phone right now, and if you have the ability to jump on via Zoom, that's really important that you do so. That is how we can actually show that you attended today and you get credit for it. If not, then we're going to need to find a way to sync with you afterward, and that's much more of a pain. So if you're on the phone right now, please consider uh, logging in via Zoom as well so that we can uh, keep track of it for you. Secondly, heads up, journal entries due on Tuesday. These are the entries that are kind of your reflections on what you've heard and what you've learned and what you've, uh, what you've had epiphany-wise, if you will, over the past few weeks from the speakers that we've had. The recordings from the past few weeks will be uploaded to Canvas this afternoon, so you can rewatch those and, and, uh, and go through those again if you would like, including the one that we have here today. And lastly, the mentorship questions that you're doing via Protopia, two very, very, very important notes on that. Um, if a mentor slash alum is responding to offer you help, please take 30 seconds and just respond to them. Don't let that go cold. Don't let that just uh, fall completely to the wayside. Again, you're not doing this to get just the points in a class. You're not doing this just to go ahead and satisfy and check some box. This truly is the most beneficial aspect of the course for you. It's your ability to go ahead and interact and engage with people who have expertise in the area that you're interested in going into, learning about, developing a skill for, whatever. So take advantage of their offer to help you and to respond to them, even if it's just a thank you or I no longer need this or anything, that's fine, but just respond. Um, if you're not comfortable with talking to them on the phone or over a text message, if that's how they, um, if that's how they prompt you to reply saying, here's my number, call anytime or something, you can email them back, that's not a problem. Just say, hey, I'd rather email if it's okay, that'd be really the best for me. Totally cool. You do not have to feel pressured to do anything otherwise. So. Um, just bear that in mind when you're responding to those. So without uh, too much further ado, I want to also give you one more thing as a heads up. Startup Career Fair, uh, the University Wide Startup Career Fair is happening next Friday. Um, that is going to involve a whole slew of companies from Ann Arbor and Detroit area, as well as all throughout the country. We typically assist uh, the student organizations that put that together, and um, it's always an annual event that a lot of students find to be pretty helpful as they're looking to attempt to uh, land leads and, and uh, their foot in the door at different companies that they want to go to. As you can imagine, it's going to be virtual. Um, it's again the 19th uh, from 9 to 6. So if you have any questions, I will send out the link on that and the announcements in Canvas, but you uh, should absolutely consider uh, participating in that. So to my point earlier about inspiration and a better future and hope, this is an alum who I've had the pleasure of meeting maybe five or so years ago when he first did E-Hour. And that was pretty cool because this entire team brought chocolate chip cookies for an audience of 400 people, which was probably the only time we've had anybody bring food to do that. It's pretty neat. And he's agreed to come back and join us today. Uh, Josh Tetrick is the CEO and co-founder of Eat Just. It's a San Francisco-based company on a mission to build a food system where everyone eats well. They have a team of world-class scientists, researchers, and Michelin-starred chefs who combine their discoveries with decades of culinary experience to create delicious, accessible, healthy, and more sustainable products. Prior to becoming a pioneer in that industry, he led a UN business initiative in Kenya worked for former President Clinton and the President of Liberia. He's a Fulbright scholar who taught uh, school children in Ni Nigeria and South Africa. 
It's been named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business, Inc.'s 35 under 35, Fortune's 40 under 40, and I'm sure the list goes on and on. Um, his company has been recognized as one of the most innovative for food and social good, disruptor, uh, one of the 50 disrupting companies of 2020, one of Time's 100 new scientific discoveries, and perhaps most importantly, he went to a school out east, something called Cornell or whatever, but most important one, he's a Michigan Law School grad, and uh, he's generously come back to offer to share some time with us today. And without further ado, I will welcome Josh. How are you doing? Hey, Josh, I don't know if you can hear us, but I think there might be a Bluetooth or a, a mic connection issue on it's something I've going on there. Maybe you give it a whirl again, but we we're getting pretty strong hey. static. Let's see if we do it like this. Can you hear me? There you go. There you go. I was, uh, Eric, thanks for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm sorry for your loss, man. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. It's kind of you. True to your nature to be that kind, generous person to open with that too. So, um, and thank you for getting up early. Uh, students, for those of you who are on right away, Josh is in Hawaii right now, and so it's about seven thirty. And Eric, let me let me be clear now. This is not just Hawaii. This is Kauai. So this is the oldest island on the Hawaiian island chain. It's about five million years old, mm. and also, and we'll talk about this a bit. Uh, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. So if you hear some combination of seals, roosters, um, mating sea turtles in the background, just know uh, that's just, that's the lovely background of Kauai. Well, you know, I'm looking outside of four inches of snow. So anytime you want to trade, let me know and we'll, yeah. we'll do that. <laughs> um, so thanks again for joining us. You know, one of the things that we always talk through with alum is, is the mantra in which we kind of teach the notion of teaching students to try risk, kind of fail and then do. Uh, you know, as we, we're, we've talked about your career before and the more I've read up on it, I mean, you embody that 101. And uh, I kind of thought maybe we could start off with just some thoughts about um, about your experience that you had in Africa and kind of what you did over there. And, you know, you it strikes me that you went outside of what had been what has been a path for you in the food tech industry to try something different before you even came into it. Talk to the students a little bit about um, the importance of trying things outside your comfort zone, why you did that, what it brought you and, and kind of how it's influenced where you are today. Yeah, I will. And, and I just want to make sure I'm uh, doing doing it in the right sequence here. Do you want me to jump in to the uh, to the presentation or do you want me to answer that question and then we'll eventually hit it? Oh, actually, I thought the presentation uh, was going to be something we just talked through. But if you did the presentation, sure, we can do that. Well, I'm right yeah, no, I got to, I got to, you know, what sure. we can do is I'll, uh, and, and feel free to just interject with questions too, as you, it doesn't, okay. have, to, it doesn't have to be me uh, running through it. Let me, can I share my screen? Yeah, go for it. Well, let's see if we can, uh, can get this done. Give me one moment. All right. Good deal. You see Perfect. that catch? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the only, the only issue with the, uh, the framework that you put out there for me, Eric, is, uh, um, the, the fail part in particular happened multiple times again and again, uh, throughout my life. Uh, so it was hard to pick just one, but sure. I wanted to start out uh, on this couch. Um, so I'm 40 now. Um, lucky enough to have a, a mission-based company, uh, over 150 people, uh, valued in the private markets over a billion dollars, but more importantly than that, really, uh, really doing some, some things that, that we think are improving the food system. And I'll share more about that. But, um, when I was 30, I was on this damn couch. Um, uh, wasn't even my couch. It was my ex-girlfriend's couch. So she was sleeping in the bed. She made me sleep on this couch. Um, and I was there because I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. Um, I had spent time in sub-Saharan Africa, you're right. A little bit of time in Liberia, um, in Kenya with the United Nations in South Africa. Um, and uh, I was there because of, um, I think, one part, wanting to have meaning in my life. Um, and I was doing a lot of work with kids. Uh, and then the other part, truly a, 
just uncertainty about what I wanted to do. I couldn't find the thing that was really lighting me up. I couldn't find the thing that was really going to enable me to build a, a livelihood for the family that I eventually uh, wanted, to, wanted to have. Um, when I was in Sub-Saharan Africa, I, um, I would often call my friends back home, uh, including folks I graduated uh, law school with. And um, I, would, uh, I would tell them that, uh, you know, I'm doing some things to help kids. I'm working with the United Nations Development Program. And it all sounds really nice. Uh, but uh, as, as some of the, the folks listening to this might know, um, if there's a disconnect between what people think about you and who you know you are, that creates a lot of emotional instability and, and turmoil. And that's what I had. People were thinking I was doing a good thing. Every day I was waking up knowing, you know, I don't feel like this is particularly effective. And it's not because nonprofits or international institutions are bad just the ones that I was dealing with um, and the nature of things, it just felt too slow. It didn't feel like we were making change at the kind of speed at the rate um, that, that I wanted to. And I felt uh, uneasy about it. Um, and I've always been, um, uh, at least through three to, to, to 19, I had a very focused goal. I wanted to, uh, to play in the NFL. Um, that's all I cared about. That was my fixation. I thought I was eventually going to be a middle linebacker for an NFL team. I ended up uh, playing a little bit of football at West Virginia University and then realized pretty quickly I wasn't good enough. Uh, and then threw my life into academics. Um, and that, that eventually led me to, uh, to Michigan uh, and to Africa. But 10 years ago, I was on this couch. I had less than $3,000 in my bank account. Um, and again, all I knew is I wanted to find that next thing uh, that could focus, that could animate my life for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I wanted it to be meaningful. Um, and uh, I read a, a book when I was in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa by a guy named C.K. Pralad, who you guys might know well, uh, because he used to teach at the University of Michigan Law School at, at Ross. Uh, and I was, um, when I was in law school, I would sneak into his class a few times and I would, I would listen to CK. Um, and the, the premise of his book uh, is that if you want to solve the world's most urgent problems, if you want to deal with homelessness, if you want to deal with inequality, if you want to deal with um, 60 million kids who are sleeping under cardboard boxes today instead of having a right to education, if you want to deal with climate change, if you want to deal with factory farming, if you want to deal with these things that probably bother you, when you step back and think about it for a moment, start a business, join a business, use the energy of capitalism to do it. And I um, didn't grow up with that notion. Um, my, my dad, for the most part, um, was uh, struggling to get jobs growing up. My mom's a hairdresser. Um, I didn't grow up with a feeling of entrepreneurship. I didn't really understand what entrepreneurship was other than I heard about some of these entrepreneurs out there and, you know, maybe someone who was uh, doing dry cleaning down the road seemed to start their own business, but that's all I knew about entrepreneurship. It didn't feel like it was, it was necessarily, it was, it wasn't related to me. Um, but CK's words really combined with um, me trying to find what I wanted to do. This new theory of the case that I thought that CK was um, talking about, um, inspired me to, to, to see if I could start over in my life, in my own life. Um, and if there was an idea out there uh, that would grab me hard enough, that would inspire me and I could throw my life into it and eventually start a company and do something meaningful. And I had an ex-girlfriend uh, who said, you can hang out on the couch for a few months while you figure it out. That was the couch. Um, and I, uh, uh, I was there as I began to dream up what this would eventually uh, become. Um, I, we do a few things at, uh, at, at Just. Um, I want to focus today's uh, talk on something that we more recently have done around uh, meat. Mm. Um, I, I heard uh, something about it. Yes, yes. So I'm on this couch. I'm thinking about the kind of company that I want to start. I have less than $3,000 in my bank account. Uh, and I decide that I want to focus on starting a company that solves real food problems. And, and when you think about real food problems out there, um, there are a handful of things that come up. So if we were aliens 
Um, if there was an alien spaceship over the planet right now, and they were talking to each other about what's happening on this little blue planet, and one alien asked the other alien, so how are they using their land down there? This is what they would respond with. So it seems like a third of the land on this little planet, one of the only that we found in the entire universe that has life, a third of it, a third of their, of their habitable land is used to plant soy and corn to feed chickens and cows and pigs, the animals that these folks consume. Just think about that. One planet, a third of it, not used for biodiverse rainforest like I see in Kauai here, but to plant chicken feed, right? Um, and demand for animal protein is exploding. More people, regardless of all the rise of plant-based, more people are eating animal protein today than they were yesterday. And more people, unfortunately, are going to be animal, eating animal protein tomorrow than they are today. It's responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions and all the transportation sources combined. Um, and the reason why I'm not with you in person right now is because there's a thing called COVID-19, which is a part of something called a zoonotic disease, which is a, an abstraction. But all a zoonotic disease is, is a disease that comes from an animal to a human because of shit that we do. Not by accident, not because someone trips over on a vial in a lab, because of things that we do like directing bulldozers to knock down trees or putting animals in tight spaces. And the United Nations said the number one reason uh, for growing um, probabilities of zoonotic disease is how we produce, consume, and treat animals for food. So I had an idea about all this, right, as I'm on the couch. I'm like, I want to change this. So I raised about half a million dollars from a guy named Vinod Kosla. Um, he founded a company called Sun Microsystems. Um, and I said, all right, I'm going to um, try to change the assumptions that people have about eating animals. One big assumption people have about eating animals is to eat an animal, you need to kill it. I'm going to say it again because it's such an important, obvious assumption that people make. To eat an animal, said another way, to eat a drumstick, to eat a hamburger, um, to um, eat a pork chop, to eat a chicken sandwich from McDonald's, to eat an animal, you necessarily have to kill an animal. You necessarily have to clear rainforest and plant feed to feed more animals. You necessarily have to do all these things. Um, <clears throat> I thought that was a wrong assumption. I thought we could figure out a way to eat animals without all the issues. And generally, that was the premise of starting the company. So um, this is my old buddy, Jake. This was day one. We got off the couch. We got into the garage. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I, again, I got a law degree. I didn't, um, I didn't get a degree in, in, uh, in food engineering. I didn't degree, get a good degree in chemical engineering. I wasn't a biochemist. I'm not. But we started the company, and we started to, uh, we started to hire people, hire people that um, knew things that I didn't know. Um, we hired biochemists, we hired analytical chemists, we hired process engineers, we hired food engineers, we hired Michelin star chefs. We hired people that could put this idea together. How do we make meat, real meat, without killing an animal, without all the issues? Um, and then we started to think critically about what this kind of technology could look like. Now, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a bit, um, I'm going to get a bit uh, uh, sciencey here. So just bear with me and then we'll, we'll, we'll get in. So um, there are about 60 plus billion chickens that are slaughtered every single year. 60 plus billion chickens. Um, and those chickens, for the most part, live for about 45 to 47 days. And they're living primarily off soy and corn. And that soy and corn that they're eating graciously every single day is providing nutrients to the muscle and the fat in that chicken, pumping them up, and then the, that chicken is slaughtered. Now, the chicken that you eat, that the world eats, doesn't look anything like the chicken did thousands of years ago. We, through an industrialized process, changed uh, the chicken. It used to be called a wild jungle fowl, this beautiful animal with beautiful feathers, uh, that can scramble up a tree. We change that animal to look like a sort of frumpy, all white, um, unfortunate creature that can barely ever move. Okay. So we said, 
what if we figure out a way to take the issues out of that process and instead focus on what people really want to meet without, without any of the harm? So it starts with identifying a cell. So we can get a cell from the root of a feather. We can get it from a biopsy of a chicken. We can get it from a free, fresh piece of meat. So think step one, we get cell. Step two, remember the soy and corn that the chicken consumes and then the, the nutrients end up building muscle and fat in the chicken's body. So we don't have the chicken's body anymore, but we do understand how to get nutrients to feed a cell. That's step two. We identify nutrients, amino acids, uh, other relevant vi vitamin in, uh, vitamins and minerals to feed the cell. And then step three, we scale it up through a process that's somewhat akin to culturing other food. It's somewhat akin to brewing beer. Mm -hmm. So our production process to make what we call cultured meat um, looks like visually, if you've ever visited a microbrewery in Ann Arbor or wherever your hometown is, vaguely, that's what it, what it looks like. We get a cell, we identify nutrients to feed the cell, um, and then we scale it up uh, through uh, a process that is, has, is very similar to culturing other food products. The end product is meat. And I'm going to say it again because it's an important thing for everyone to understand. The piece of chicken that you see on the right is not vegan chicken or vegetarian chicken or plant-based chicken or chicken alternative or whatever term that you want to put on it. It literally is chicken, meaning... If anyone you has a chicken allergy and you take a bite of it, you're going to get, you're going to break out and you got to go see a doctor. It literally is chicken, nutritionally, flavor profile, the whole deal. So we begin investing in the technology that I just described. I thought that um, when we begin investing in it, that it'll probably take us out two, three years and we'll eventually put it on the market. Um, you know, such is life that doesn't end up happening. Um, the biggest barrier to eventually um, releasing this into the world was regulatory approval. So we had the idea for the technology, right? We had the idea for the vision. We knew what was guiding us. But the problem is there wasn't a single country around the world, not the U.S., not China, not France, not Brazil, not a single country that had a regulatory framework that allowed for the sale of meat that doesn't require killing an animal. It would be similar to um, not a single country around the world has a regulatory framework for the sale of a fully self-driving car, right? The departments of transportation need to construct a framework that allows for the safe sale of it. So um, one big roadblock that we had is we had a technology, we had the product, but we couldn't sell it. Um, and that, that obviously was very frustrating to the team. And, um, we eventually began really focusing on Singapore is the place uh, that we wanted to focus the the uh, the locus of our energy. Singapore is a particularly forward thinking uh, country. They have a really substance based regulatory framework. Uh, the government has a program called 30 by 30 that says they want at least 30 percent of their food made domestically by 2030 to mitigate food security issues. Uh, so we submitted a, a, a large uh, and substantive dossier to, to Singapore where we talked about the safety of the product. Um, two years later, um, we got word on Thanksgiving of 2020 that we received approval to sell this. And what we're selling, and I'll, I'll get to it, uh, is entirely non-GMO. So there's no genetic modification uh, in it. Uh, at all. Um, when you compare this chicken to conventional chicken, you find a pretty significant gap in terms of relevant food safety issues. So not just zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, but aerobic plate counts and coliforms and E. coli and salmonella. And this is pretty gross in the morning, at least where I am, but I'll say it, oh. even fungal contamination, right? The reality is that conventional ways of producing animals, there's no way of getting around it, um, have a lot of issues, including some of these food safety issues, because you're dealing with a live animal after all. But when you make meat in this way, you end up mitigating a lot of it. Uh, but it's not just food safety, sa food safety issues that you're mitigating. Um, you're also creating uh, a much more um, conducive meat product for the planet that we all want to live on. Mm -hmm. So meat that can use 90%, that uses 90% fewer carbon emissions than conventional meat. 
that uses 99% less land, that uses 90% or so less water uh, used. From a human health perspective, again, is not different nutritionally, is the same nutritionally. And maybe the thing, um, uh, Eric and everyone, that appeals to me um, in the most personal way, um, I don't think in order to have fried chicken, and that's what I grew up uh, on in, uh, in Alabama, or to sit down with your friends eventually and have a roast beef sandwich at Zingerman's, that we need to kill a single thing. Yeah. And there are a lot of reasons why the, the food system is, is so broken today, particularly as we think about how we use animals. But the simplest, the most straightforward, the thing free of, um, the thing that gives me the most clarity is, I don't think another life needs to be taken off this planet for us to engage in the simple pleasures of hanging out with friends and having chicken mm. or beef or pork. Uh, and that's what that's what this is about. And that's why um, fighting to get off that damn couch. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, I got to ask you, Josh, one of the students said, was the couch comfy? And I wasn't going to bring it up, but you brought up. Uh, well, the so I no, it actually, yeah, I won't lie. It actually was very comfortable. I, I wish that couch was here right now. She gave me a blanket, not a thick blanket, thin blanket. Um, gave me water every once and again when I asked. <laughs> <laughs> A deal. So, <laughs> she, she was awesome. Um, but uh, because there's such a, uh, a, a, a push to want to do this, it, you know, propelled me off the couch. It, yeah. it helped me to deal with the regulatory issues that were happening and also helped me to, to, to fight through um, even some corporate governance issues that we were having that, uh, that, that related to ensuring that me and, and my team had control over the, the levers of the company. Um, so in December, um, after we received regulatory approval, we did something pretty historic. We actually launched it. So if you step back and you think that for thousands of years, us humans, in order to eat meat, first we had to take a spear and kill an animal. And then in the fifties, we developed more industrialized means of killing animals. But for the first time folks sat down and they had real meat without an animal losing its life, without a tree being ripped out, without a single drop of antibiotics. It happened at a high-end restaurant in Singapore called 1880. Um, and the very first table for this historic moment on December 19th at 7 p.m. 2020 was a group of young people between uh, 12 uh, and 18. Um, the first question that they asked a young girl named Kaya, who's 12, as she sat down to, to try this, is can this, use, can this technology be used to help more animals? Can this technology be used to do more than just chicken? Uh, and, and the answer to that uh, was, was yes. So these young kids sat down, they made some history. Uh, that's what our chicken looks like. Um, you might be surprised that it looks like a chicken bite, chicken nugget. Um, it tastes like a chicken bite or a chicken nugget. Um, nutritionally, it's the same. Again, it just doesn't have the, the issues that, that typical chicken uh, might have. We served a variety of dishes, um, Chinese influenced, Brazilian influenced, uh, American influenced. Um, we um, put people in this immersive environment. These are the, these are the four kids that, that first night where we took them through um, what the food system used to look like, um, what it started to look like in the 50s, what it's going to look like if we don't change. Um, and um, we got some good responses, um, mostly from uh, not only from some of these journalists here, but from the young people who thought it was a, a really important solution to, to solving problems that, that really matter to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and folks made made history as they sat down. And it's it's easy to um, as I wrap up here, it, it's easy to, or even me or any of members of my team to look at this and feel like we should be fixated on some of these headlines. We were, it was named the number one moment of 2020 by the Good Food Institute. Uh, Wired said it was one of 20 things that made the world better in 2020. Vox said it was one of the breakthroughs of the year. Guardian called it one of the scientific breakthroughs of the year. But underneath all that, um, was a lot of grind. 
was that couch, um, was that garage with me and Jake without the first clue about how we wanted to approach tackling this, um, was um, a misunderstanding of corporate governance and the kind of governance approach that was the most conducive to building the kind of long-term company that we wanted um, was a misunderstanding in me about the proper way to scare t scale technology and the kind of team that you need. But through all that, and we still have a long way to go. This is only the really the first course in this uh, this dinner that we want to build. Uh, through all that, um, the most important lesson, and there are a lot, but the most important lesson is whether something is good or whether something is bad, or someone says you're the best, or someone says you're a failure, or someone says you're the worst, the most important thing you can do is keep your head down and mm. do things. Um, mm. Because at the end of the day, it's um, doing things, doing effective things that increase the probability of achieving the mission that ends up shining through and ends up you know, really showing up on what is the most important scoreboard of, of life. So mm. got a lot more to go, but uh, yeah, well, I, and, you know, journey. It's, it's occurring to me as you're, you're talking, the flurry of student questions we have coming in means that so many of them maybe not have read through the profiles that we sent out because they're all enamored and amazed, but that means maybe they didn't know about this before. So I think an important <laughs> Point of context for them to realize is that it wasn't like you went off the couch and you developed a recipe to uh, come up with the cultured chicken in the kitchen and then bam you're in Singapore and it all happens if you wouldn't mind take students and give them a, 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 the quick and dirty on how just uh, created the egg how you basically have the egg market on lock and then I presume this yeah. fuels the ability to explore and research and do all these other yeah yeah no, yeah sure so we you know we're a we're a uh, we're a food technology company um and a food technology company that's focused on making the food system putting the food system in a place that aligns more with our values basic things like being kind um and our food system today doesn't represent it um and the first thing that we did um i told you about the assumption that we made about meat why does it have to be the case that an animal is killed for you to eat meat, for me to eat meat. We disagree with that assumption. Um, there was another assumption that we also tackled and were um, available widely in the market with this. It's that um, why does an egg need to come from an animal? Think about how obvious that assumption is, right? Imagine asking, asking a million people, um, uh, do you agree with the statement an egg necessarily needs to come from an animal? Um, I, I would imagine 99.9% put aside some conspiracy theorists would say yes to that. <laughs> yes to that question. We challenged that. And we said that an egg can come from a plant. And we eventually developed a product called Just Egg, which is available in 20,000 points of distribution, including all over Ann Arbor, um, uh, whether at Whole Foods or local natural uh, grocery stores um, or online with Amazon Fresh. Um, and we build a company off that. And uh, what I just described in me was the, the second leg of the, this long journey mm. that, we're, that we're doing. And, and we had to, we and, and I had to figure out a way to do lots of things that we weren't necessarily comfortable with along the way because we had never done them before. Um, like scaling up technology from a lab, like raising capital, like building a board, um, like firing a lot of people like hiring a lot of people, right? All things that um, I didn't have a sense for until uh, until I started this and and, uh, and still- It's been and a while, still, right? Still so, you know, it's, it's funny uh, to hear you talk about and reflect on the ride that it's been. Um, one of, I think, a, a fellow alum who I'm sure you've come to know and who speaks highly of you, uh, Samir Call of uh, Coastal Ventures, uh, was a speaker at this class last uh, semester, I think it was. And when I was talking to him uh, privately, we were talking about you and the Hampton Creek to just transition and all. And he's always very quick to call out. He goes, you know, don't count Josh out. That's one guy you do not count out. He will bounce back. 
Um, so if you don't mind, give us a sense of what it is that that uh, empowers your resilience and your ability to power through um, any obstacle or to your point about the egg and the meat, um, even the unthinkable. Um, I think it's probably, a, it's probably, I'm going to, I'm just going to go back to the couch as I answer this question. This is my favorite slide. Um, it's probably a couple of things. I think, uh, I think one is that, uh, you know, I didn't have the, the easiest time growing up. So we, I grew up in a family a little bit below the, the, uh, average income in the US, um, wasn't always the best at home. Um, and, you know, I, I do think dealing with things, just like shooting a basketball uh, or writing, dealing with things uh, effectively is a habit. Um, and understanding how to deal with shit that's really hard um, that is really bothering you, that can be traumatic um, in a way where, um, in a healthy way and moving past it, you build up habit energy around dealing with things. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, do think to some extent growing up um, in a, an environment that wasn't always the easiest um, did help me develop that habit energy of dealing with something that that's particularly hard. Um, I wake up the next day um, and I don't let that thing drag me down today. It sounds like a, the most general advice, mm. but, but the reality is that, um, that the more that one can stay focused on the process of this moment, um, as opposed to the thing that happened a second ago, or even the thing that could happen, a second uh, ahead, it it uh, that's been helpful. I think developing the habit energy around that, and and I and I think also underlying it is, um, I only have you know one very short life. Whether I live to sixty or ninety, that is a really short, brief life, mm -hmm. um, and I do not want to use this short, brief life that I have um whining and complaining and being sorry for myself uh, because all of that energy doesn't actually do anything for me personally it doesn't do anything for the animals that i care about it doesn't do anything for my mom or my girlfriend or my brother mm -hmm. um so there's a there's a bit of it that's just about what increases the probability of being effective um and being resilient is is also about being effective and that's what i want to be mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that's powerful words. Um, you know, to your point about overcoming obstacles and having that habit energy and kind of muscling through and developing that core uh, inertia that, that carries you forward. Undoubtedly, the regulatory hurdles and the bureaucracy, having come from a background in government prior to the academics, I can attest must have been horrendous to have to deal with and get through and begrudgingly go through. So my question is kind of two part. One, uh, you had previously stated that the biggest compliment an inventor can get was to have the normalization of their invention. Uh, I'm interested in what you would say the biggest compliment has been to date for you guys, or maybe for you personally. And then the second part of the question is, now that Singapore has uh, allowed the debut of the next gen of food, uh, what country is next and when can we see it? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the normalization piece. So, uh, this slide right here that I'm showing, showing everyone, this is not a consumer friendly slide, right? This is not, this is not a marketing slide. This is literally what we're doing. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't fault you for looking at this process and thinking this is awfully strange looking. This looks a bit like science fiction. You wouldn't be you wouldn't be odd in thinking that, right? We're taking a cell, identifying nutrients, and manufacturing chicken without killing a live animal. That, in many ways, is objectively odd. Like there's no getting around it. Now, I think the way we currently deal with our food system is also bizarre and odd too. So, 
in terms of normalization, Eric, eventually I want um, people to come to accept that um, meat doesn't require killing an animal, just like people are coming to accept that um, you don't need internal combustion engine in order to make a sexy car. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so far with this process, the, the best compliment was from uh, this young kid. His name is, uh, his, let me see if I can find him. His name is uh, Verdeep. He's the, he's the kid on the right trying it. Mm -hmm. um, someone at the table asked him, hey, Verdeep, what do you think? And he said, um, you know, it, it's just chicken. And I do think uh, often... Um, the younger you are, the less your mind is cluttered with all the assumptions that society likes to put in your mind. Um, you know, Verdeep, it's even more obvious to him that if, why would you kill an animal to make food? It's a bizarre notion to him. Um, so that was probably the biggest compliment when he said it was just chicken. He didn't couch it with it. it's cultured chicken, it's lab grown chicken or any of these other terms that people append to it. He just said it's, uh, chicken. Um, and then in terms of just dealing, dealing with, you know, the, the longevity of the regulatory process, is just another example of things that, you know, one has to, to, uh, to cope with, with a company like this. Um, you, you want is you, you ensure that the process that you're engaged in the substantive fact-based evidence-based process of transmitting information to regulators, um, is done, it's done in a timely way. And you're doing, you can't control what's in a regulator's mind. All you can do is control um, the information that you're providing to them. And you can control, you know, running a, a straightforward, transparent process with them, nothing else. Um, particularly in a place like Singapore where politics are not a relevant feature. It's about what the evidence is saying. Um, so we, you know, we just banked on keeping our heads down and running a good process would eventually uh, get us there. And it's not that it wasn't frustrating that it took two years. It is frustrating. Uh, but uh, I was uh, I was listening to this uh, this young woman who uh, competed in the Olympics, and she said, um, in chasing a dream, she lives by the rule of thirds. She said, um, a third of the time it's going to be phenomenal. Um, a third of the time it's going to be fine. And then a third time, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. Um, and I think that's right. Um, and I think, uh, I think um, that's okay, right? That's once you have those expectations that things are going to be incredibly hard. And yeah, you're going to have some highs too. Um, it gives you a bit of perspective not to get all not to get all freaked out when things get a little bit challenging. It's just, it's just a part of the process, which yeah. is why entrepreneurship is sure as hell not for everyone. Mm. Um, it, it is not necessarily the recipe to lead the most serene, peaceful life. I will say that. So going back to the thought of serene and peaceful, Singapore is a nice warm place, sometimes way too hot, some might say. Hawaii is not bad. I noticed that when you did the uh, the chicken tasting, you mentioned Brazil was in there. So I'll go back to that thought again. Where where's the next place that we can expect a normalization yeah. of cultured chicken? Um, so we're we're working with regulators um, uh, most uh, intentionally in the U.S. So we hope the U.S. is the next place that it comes. Both the FDA and the USDA are regulating it. Um, we'll see with the new administration, how it plays out. We're hopeful that, uh, that, that a framework to allow the sale for this does happen. But if you, you know, you step back and you think about the, the process of making meat without killing an animal, it's very capital intensive initially, it's somewhat similar to building an electric car facility, um, with the prospect of some payout sometime in the future. Now, my payout is, um, the the changing of the food system. And for some investors, their payout is simply financial and that that's fine. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of risk that you necessarily must take in doing this because I can't tell you a certainty that Brazil or the U S is going to provide a regulatory framework. I, I have no way of knowing that mm -hmm. I'm betting though. I think it's more likely than not. I think the probability says, um, that countries eventually want to move to things that are sensible and reasonable and that help their environment and help their people. Um, 
but that's a that's a part of the risk that we take in doing this, right? Um, the only place that this is allowed to be sold today is in an island called Singapore with fewer than two million people. Mm. Uh, but I believe other folks are going to follow Singapore, um, oh, and eventually we're going to get to a place where, by the time my niece June, um, you know, gets into Michigan, um, the majority of chicken, beef, eggs, milk, whatever doesn't require killing a single animal, doesn't require tearing down a single tree, doesn't require a single drop of antibiotics, is not accelerating our risk of zoonotic diseases. And she's able to hang out and eat some chicken with her friends without even thinking about all this stuff, which mm. is doing a way that aligns a lot more with the kind girl that she is. Mm. All right, let me, we got about a minute and a half left. So let me help you with some rapid fire questions and give me the short first answers and uh, we'll close it off kind of on a lightning rod here. Um, Favorite place at Michigan, if you could go back, spend a day, half day, bar, restaurant, place on campus, professor's classroom, what is it? Um, favorite place is probably, um, I know it's early. Yeah, no, no, it's all right. You know, it's, it's probably just because it's just the, the, the memories of hanging out. Uh, most of my memories are hanging with my friends around the law school quad. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's probably just, it's not even like sitting down in the law school quad, it's just walking around. Um, yeah. My friends talking about, talking about what, what's going on. Beautiful space, beautiful space. Um, what's your go-to guilty item? Your go-to dessert guilty item? Um, probably my, my, uh, my girlfriend uh, is a really healthy eater, just like me. But she she usually brings in these contraband items, these like these fu vegan fudge bars, these vegan fudge brownies, these pies, all this all this stuff, and she hides them in different parts of the refrigerator and cabinets. But I, I, I wish I wouldn't find them, but I always figure out a way to find them. And so it's a, it's a constant battle between us. It's it's something that she brings in like that. Good deal. Good deal. And, uh, you know, last question, we can kind of close out here. I've never seen you shy away from your thoughts on a political situation. And if I remember in 2016, you were quite bold uh, right after the election with the New York Times advertisement you did that I thought was very innovative. Um, one day, when are we going to see candidate Tetrick? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you before I, before I say anything about myself, um, I... Uh, my, my hope is that I, I do think it, it's really healthy for this country to have um, a thoughtful um, uh, a thoughtful Republican Party. Uh, and I, I want that again. Um, and I, my hope is that uh, that Trumpism has seen uh, is beginning to see its last uh, gasp. We'll see if that ends up happening. But that's my that's my personal belief on it. Um, you know, I um, I found my thing. Eric, you know, I, I found the place, the the place that I want to focus my my mind and my heart and spend time with people. Um, there are a lot of things that are screwed up in the world, right? It's not just the food system. We all we all see it all around us. Um, but I, I found something that has some of those characteristics of why I spent so much time trying to be a football player. It uh, it animates me. It allows me to stretch my brain and allows me to hang out with people that I care about. It allows me to wake up in the morning and not feel like there's an inconsistency uh, with, with who I am and how the world uh, views me. Um, so this is, this is going to be my, uh, my spot, not, not doing anything else. So as long as I, I, I can still get at it. Okay. Good deal. Well, thank you for the time.